Hey everybody, today I'm going to be interviewing Curtis Stone from Green City Acres. I've known Curtis for about seven years and I've watched Curtis over the last seven years absolutely crush it. He's been able to do things in farming that most people can never achieve in their entire lifetime. Curtis is generating close to $100,000 on a third of an acre on a series of urban lots in Kelowna and there's an incredible amount of information and knowledge that you can get from just following um, the steps that Curtis takes on his own farm. I wanted to interview Curtis to share some of those insights with you. Um, and if you want more of these insights, I highly recommend checking out his YouTube channel as well as his website, urbanfarmer.co. Super awesome that you can make it onto the show today, Curtis. Thanks for coming out. Let's, uh, let's get into this. I'm stoked to be here. So Curtis, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what you've been up to over the last little while, but specifically, you know, you've been market gardening for the last seven years and you've probably had a lot of incredible experiences, a lot of painful experiences. You've learned through tinkering, through uh, working through lots of different options and optionality. Um, but I really want to distill down your learnings down into like the top three learnings that you've had over the last seven years. What would those be um, and how have you applied them? There, there's, there's a bunch. I'll, I'll narrow it down to three. I think the number one thing is understanding the Pareto principle, the rule of 80-20. Right. That is uh, a critical principle to understand if you're in business. I also find it's a great thing to understand in life in general because it explains a lot about how the world works. So the basic idea of the Pareto principle, for those that don't understand it, is that 20% of... Um, effects will lead to 80% of causes. So for example, 20% of your customers will be 80% of your business. 20% right. uh, of your workforce will bring in 80% of your productivity. And it's, some people often boil it down to a square root amount to like, so if you have a, if you have a, if you have a company with a hundred people, there'll be 10 people in that company that will actually bring in 50% of the value of the company. So there's different ways of looking at it, but that's the basic idea. So for myself, um, what was really critical for me in the following years after I started farming, I started in, well, this is my eighth year of operation here. So my first couple of years, I tried a lot of stuff. And my third, fourth, and fifth years, I kept refining and refining. And I basically just kept narrowing down on that 80-20. So it was products and customers, and then it later became techniques and things like that. So I kept narrowing it down, and that made my farm more profitable, less work on less land. Incredible. So that's the number one. Um, the second thing, too, I wonder if all of these would be somewhat related to the Pareto Principle. But one thing, too, was just or the, would be just undiscriminately looking at numbers and analyzing information based on just raw data and not having a cognitive bias or, or, or sort of a confirmation bias. Because one thing that I see a lot of farmers do is they, they go, oh, I want to start a CSA because these reasons. And a CSA is a great thing to do. But does a CSA deliver for your context? So understanding your context is very important. And then putting that through the filter of truth, which is looking at facts and numbers and saying, okay, what do the numbers tell me? And should I fall? And if I'm in the, if I'm in this to make a living, then I need to follow that, those facts and those numbers and then go from there. So looking at the numbers would be the second. And I think the third would be picking, picking your customers and, and sort of identifying and it's funny, none of these are directly related to specific production techniques, but um, I find, you know, the biggest, you know, how you run your business is so important and really just looking at who are the kind of people you want to sell to and do those people really deliver. And so one thing I found in recent years, like I've changed my farm's marketing approach many times. I've gone through, I used to just do farmer's markets. Then I started to run a CSA. Then I did all three of those things, farmer's markets. I did restaurants and a CSA. And I started doing selling to distributors, wholesalers, grocery stores. I've done all kinds of marketing approaches. But restaurants were the thing that delivered me the most amount of value, uh, right. maybe in my third, fourth, and fifth year of farming, because I can move large amounts of product really easily. But the thing that restaurants didn't do that I discovered over time is that, yeah, you can move a lot of product, but the customer management is very critical 
with, with restaurants. Like you are on the phone all the time. You're answering text messages. There's a lot of customer nurturing that needs to be done there. Mm -hmm. So even though you're moving a lot of volume, you know, you're getting this lower prices. You're, you're, you're getting a, they're getting a discount because they're buying a lot, but there's a lot of customer management there and restaurants don't always pay their bills, which I've found, unfortunately, <laughs> through the years of doing this, like I've been screwed at a $10,000 at one point, <sighs> you know, no, no regrets, whatever, but this is how it goes. And so I think when you have, like I said, in point two, is if you can look at the numbers indiscriminately, you also have to look at the facts regarding your customers and, and not be afraid to make hard decisions there. And one for me was I eliminated about 80% of the restaurants that I sold to. And I decided to just start selling to grocery stores because yes, I was getting a lower price, but I was moving volume and there was very little customer management that needed to be done. And they always paid their bills. Right. So those, those would be my top three takeaways. Right. So lots of moving parts, being selective about your clients, taking sentiment out of the business. I mean, what's crazy about this is that these ideas could be applied to any business. And it's amazing how often I see people not putting these ideas into the way that they run business. Typically, you know, a lot of times people will start a business because they're a technician. They're really good with what they do, but they think that going into business is going to allow them to kind of pursue their passions and do more of what they love to do. But then they wake up one day and realize, wait a second, I actually have to get some business skills in order to succeed at what I'm doing. And I don't know about you, Curtis, but for me, that insight came when I had kids. And so as soon as I had kids, all of a sudden I realized that if I wasn't being hard nosed and being really selective about who I did business with, um, you know, that was basically time that I was not spending time with my kids because if I was not making money, I had to work longer hours, I had to work harder. Um, and so for me, having kids really reinforced this idea of being super selective and making sure that everything that I did was actually turning a buck on the other side. Oh yeah. And I mean, I, I, I've, I've learned to be good at this over the last number of years and these last three years i've really refined it because our farm is the most profitable it's ever been but since having a daughter it's just like i don't have time for any bs like yeah. every everything that isn't delivering is cut and okay. um you know the, the, you get good at doing that but you, one thing that's also easier what's also good to do too is learn how to delegate you cool. know and, and that's one thing too is like okay yeah this one particular thing or customer or task or whatever it is um, might not be delivering as much as I want to, but then perhaps I can justify delegating it to somebody else and their time might be less valuable than mine. And then I can still get some kind of return from it if I delegate it. Totally. You know, one of the things just listening to you talk about those top three learnings um, I really zoned in on on all the different experimentation that you've run. You've tried all sorts of different models. And, you know, when you think about business, business itself uh, relies a lot on luck, probably a lot more than a lot of entrepreneurs think. And because luck is so random, um, one of the only things you can do to, to stack luck in your favor is by running tons and tons of experiments. So having watched you over the last seven years, I can say that you pretty much run every experiment in the book and continue to do that you continue to innovate and try new things and see which ones work and which ones don't and it's that incessant desire to innovate and try experiments that i think has really led to a ton of success for you yeah yeah it's it's tinkering and 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 that that you know i i've been doing that for a long time but after reading anti-fragile by nassim taleb it even it kind of like ingrained it into my psyche on more of a, a philosophical level as well to really really set myself up to do that. And, and so that's, that's what I've done. I've created a lot of automation on my operation and just by delegating um, and streamlined a lot of things by simplifying our processes and then right. simplifying our customer base was a big part of that so that I can mostly focus on R and D. And that's mostly what I do on my farm is I do R and D I film it and I put it up on YouTube for the world to see. Right. Yeah. That's what I love about your YouTube channel. There's just so much good content. So you've obviously seen a ton of operations specifically around farming in your travels, and you've seen both market gardens and livestock farms and all sorts of farms. And really, I mean, broadly speaking, you farm, even though your niche is market gardening. What would you say the weakest link is that you've seen through all of your travels looking at all of these farms? Yeah, so, the, I mean, but yeah, the fortunate thing I've had is I've done a lot of traveling in the last number of years, like you said, I mean, I've been teaching market gardening for six years now, but the last two years I've done a ton of traveling. I've also done a ton of consulting. I've worked with hundreds of farms across North America, New Zealand and Australia. 
And um, the weakest link, hands down, is is people don't run it like a business. They right. just don't. A lot of people in the big green umbrella, you know, if you will, of permaculture and all this great stuff, um, is that we have a, a group, a, a bunch of people who want to do good in the world, and that is the best thing, in my opinion. That's the best way to go about um, starting a business and 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 changing things in the world is to do good, but. Too many of us get, um, they just get, we get too fascinated with all the possibilities because, you know, all it takes is watching a series of Jeff Lawton videos and Bill Mollison classics to go, oh my God, look at all these things I can do. But which one of those things is going to bring home the bacon for you? And that's, that's the thing. It's, it's that people don't really, they don't look at the business side of it. And that, that's where I find the weakest link is most farmers are just kind of throwing stuff in the ground and hoping people will buy it. Yeah, I think this really ties to what you were saying about sentiment. You know, a lot of people go into farming because they think it's going to give them a better quality of life. And in fact, that was one of your main reasons, I think, when we talked earlier, um, was that you went into this actually to, to have a better quality of life. But, um, you know, if you're not making money, it can actually be diminishing to your quality of life. You have to have both pieces kind of working. And that's what's so incredible about your story is that you've been able to have an incredible quality of life, pursue your passion farming, um, and do it in a way that actually makes you money. So I think it's a great case study for other people to observe and mimic or replicate in their own system. Yeah, yeah. And and that and that's really like what it's about is is and I've been saying this one for a long time is that you just got to pick one thing, nail that, and then move on to the next, but don't move on to the next thing until you nail that. And that's why, like, I mean, I get people who, you know, I see hundreds of comments on the YouTube all the time. I get so many emails a day. I can't answer them, but people are always saying, Curtis, why aren't you doing rainwater caption? Why aren't you doing solar powered? Which, well, I am now, but I mean, why aren't you doing this and this and this? It's like, because I'm working on the one thing to get that, and then I'll go to the next thing. So, I mean, for example, my house is solar powered now. So it's like, okay, check that off the list. But it was just, you can't, you can't go out and create that quality of life if you're continuously grinding it out. And if you want to have a family, like I have now, you, to, to have that balance, to have time for your family and work is near impossible if you just got this seed bomb the permaculture seed bomb of everything, and you're trying to do all of it, you're not going to get one thing completed until you focus on that one thing. And so for me, that was make my market garden as profitable and streamlined as possible, then I can go and do all these other things. And that's what I'm doing now. So I've got my house on solar, I'm putting a rainwater catchment system into my property, I'm doing all these things now that I can because I've, I've afforded my time and got a nice amount of capital resources behind me that I can do these things. But I have seen so many farms go broke and burnt out because they try to do everything at once. And that is just not the way to do it. That's not even the way to, that's not how it's done in nature. You know, if we're going to talk about permaculture, modeling nature is really important. And that's just not how things work in nature. There's, there isn't, nothing just goes out and tries to do everything at once. It's like, if you're, if you're a, if you're a lion in the jungle, your first priority is to eat. And so you're going to find food for your family before you make a nest or decide to have offspring or whatever it's going to be, you need to get that one thing done. And so uh, you can, you can make that as broad as you want in terms of just a business approach in general, like if in a business approach, you know, it's just like get that one product, make that one product really good, get your market copy dialed in, get all that. But then on a farm, it's like pick the couple crops, the things that you can focus on, or perhaps one market stream, get that really dialed in before you go into the next. Right. Those are, again, basic business principles and, you know, not getting overwhelmed with too many options too quickly allows you to focus in on something and get it right uh, the first time or maybe after the first or second time. Whereas if you're doing too many things, you get distracted and you can't get anything right. I totally agree with all of that. So, Curtis, every year we've talked, you go into the year being super stoked about something within the urban farming field or your business. What is it this year that's got you super excited? Um, well, there, there, there's, there's a lot of stuff I'm stoked about right now. I mean, market gardening is a wild west right now of innovation. Like there's just so many opportunities in it. It's unbelievable. 
there's a whole new bunch of tools that have come out. I'm working with a lot of companies right now on refining some of these tools. I think the thing I'm just so stoked about right now is that what market gardening is going to look like in a couple of years is going to be very different than what it looks like now. There's a series of tools that have come out that are absolute game changers. Wow. Um, one, one particular tool that I'm working with right now is called a paper pot transplanter. Yeah. And this tool will literally save a farm hundreds to thousands of hours a season, depending on what, you know, how much transplanting you do. Uh, my farm actually doesn't do that much transplanting. We mostly do direct seeding, but we're using this tool for our planting of our lettuce crop. We grow a, a lettuce called Salanova lettuce, which we do in transplants right. and we do a lot of it. And so, you know, it takes, it takes about 45 minutes to one hour for one person to transplant a bed of Salanova, a 50 foot bed of Salanova. So that's to pop out the plugs from the tra- from the, the flats and then to go and put them in the ground. Right. This, this tool can now do that in about four minutes. Th- that, that's just one tool. There is a lot of other tools that are coming out now that are, that are changing that. So, I mean, the way things are going, I wouldn't be surprised in five years um, how it, it, the resources it takes to manage, say, a, a market garden that would require four full-time people would probably be able to do with one person with some part-time people to help do packing. That's incredible. What I'm looking at doing right now, and I'm, I'm working with a, a selection of, of market gardeners around the United States that we're innovating some of the stuff with these tools together and sort of a hive mind mentality. And so that's another thing that I'm really stoked about too in the space is just the fact that so many people are just sharing information mm. and it's really helping move the whole space forward because we're innovating these things really quickly and leaps and bounds. Whereas the old school farming mentality is hold on to your secrets and don't tell anybody else. It's a scarcity mindset type thing where you don't want to share anything because you're scared that somebody's going to screw you. Right. But well, uh, that, that's that, not the case. Yeah. That's something that you've always been a fan of is open sourcing it. I've always respected you for that. So you're going to be teaching a series of courses this year and open sourcing all of this stuff that you've learned over the last seven years. Can you tell me a little bit about the workshops that you're going to be running this summer? Yeah, yeah. I'm kind of moving to a new format where I'm trying to... My mission isn't so much to just introduce the idea of living off your land and making a living from it as it is to create the 100 Spartans, if you will, that whole, the, the, the whole idea behind the Spartan was that, and this is a historical thing where the Spartan army that was 300, you know, they made that action movie built, built, called 300, it was 300 Spartans that took on, you know, an army of tens or hundreds of thousands, is that the idea is that if these people are super trained, that they can go out and just obliterate the scene and just and go out and just completely spread the knowledge. And that's, that's what I want to do. I want to train the ultimate people and give them more information that they need, but deliver it to them in a way where they see it in context and then can take that and replicate it. So I've spent the last six years teaching a one or two day format where I go and I teach at a place. It's usually a PowerPoint lecture. Sometimes there's a second day in the field. But my farm is now at a point where, I mean, I own my own land now, or part of it. I own my home base, which is predominantly where our farm operates. And then I have six other plots around it. I also have another plot that is, doesn't have a home on it. So I have a lot of freedom to do what I want there. So now I have this system that I can bring people in. Right. And so that is my, is my mission now is to, I'm running a five-day f- format where people come to my farm, I can only eight, take 18 people at a time. So selection is limited, uh, but um, is have them come here completely open source everything. They come, they see how I work on my office. They come, they see how we pack, how we work day to day and how we structure our week. And so the way this format is going to work is that we've got, I have a, a, a hall that I teach at. It's, it's called the Italian club. It's on the same street as one of my main plots, which nice. is blocks from my house. Yeah. So, Students will be there for the morning. We'll do lectures. We'll look at spreadsheets. We'll talk about production planning and all this kind of stuff, market planning and all this kind of stuff. But then the later in the day, they'll actually be witnessing 
how well, what we're doing on the farm specifically and how our week flows. So the neat thing is, is they're going to see how our five day work fe- week flows from Monday to Friday, from when we're planting in the field, when we're preparing beds to when we're delivering to customers, to when we're packing, to then cycling it all over again. They're going to see how the work week flows. And that's one of the things that's always been hard for me to teach at, like on a one or two day workshop because they don't see it in real time. And we only have so much time in the day to discuss right. all these subjects. So yeah. this is very, very intensive. And so I'm also offering that internationally. Now I did, I did the first one in New Zealand this February, and I'm going to be taking this on the road in the United States. But this one in Kelowna is like a super rare opportunity to come here and actually see my whole operation. It, and I, I don't hold anything back. I'm, I'm very um, forthcoming in, in information. People are going to come, you can look at my spreadsheets, you can look at my numbers, you can see how I manage all the accounts and everything. And so it's a, it's an extremely rare opportunity. Yeah, I, I kind of want to take one of your courses, to be honest. You know, we grow a lot of our food in the summer, not necessarily market garden style, but right now we're looking at getting a farm. And I can see that, you know, observing how you work on a day-to-day basis for, a, um, you know, a farm that produces as much food as you do would be super valuable. Every time we talk, Curtis, I just get so stoked about all the stuff going on in your system. So, hey guys, if you're looking to get into market gardening, this is the guy to take the course from. Curtis has been through all the pain, he's figured out all the systems, and he's going to let you skip those early years, uh, those early painful years of getting to know all the different moving parts in a market farm. Hey Curtis, thinking about the 100 Spartans idea that you were talking about earlier, I'm wondering, have you read Exponential Organizations I started to when we last hung out, um, but I haven't finished it. Okay, well, in there he talks about MTP, which basically stands for Massive Transformative Purpose. You know, your 100 Spartans sounds to me like an MTP. And basically the whole premise to MTP, for people who haven't heard about it, is that you, in order for it to be an MTP, you have to affect a billion people, which sounds totally overwhelming. But if every single one of these Spartans that you train goes out and does something similar to what you're doing, you'll absolutely transform the whole farming system, which will affect a billion people. That's just it. I mean, I I, I have a a number of sort of uh, disciples that I've taught over the years. I've taught a lot of people over the years because I've been traveling for a while now. But, you know, one example who's like one of my all-star examples of my system is a a fellow named Ray Tyler in in Memphis, Tennessee. And um, I I trained him one-on-one because he he did a lot of consulting with me. And he was at a point where he had a farm that was, more broad acre, and he was doing everything. He was doing pastured pigs and poultry, and he had a market garden. And uh, he had he has five kids now. He had four at the time. One of his daughters was going through chemotherapy or had cancer, and and, and it was a really really tough situation for them. And they, basically, I took his, or I helped him redirect his farm. I got him to get rid of the animals. And I'm not saying people should get rid of animals. It was just, it's all about his context here and the lifestyle that he wanted. And we took his market garden that was on more than an acre and it made $10,000 the year before he started working with me. When I finished with them, his market garden scaled down in size to about half an acre and they did $100,000 of revenue the next wow. day by basically applying these principles. And so Ray Tyler is, I'm teaching one of my workshops on his farm in Memphis or just awesome. in Memphis in Selmer. And, and he's, an, he's, a, he's a prime example of how streamlining, focusing on that 80-20, indiscriminately looking at the business and just going, what works? How do I want to have my quality of life set up? And can I pay for my daughter to get through cancer treatment, which he did, but they bounced through back. Unbelievable story and just an absolute transformation. And, uh, you know, I actually have people that come to my workshops that aren't even market gardeners. I have a lot of people who do pasture animals that come to my workshops because they're interested in how we structure the business and how we run our day-to-day operations. Cause there's a lot of information in there for everybody. Right. It, it's really about balancing workflow and deciding what to delegate and task management and all that kind of stuff. That's all in this content. So Curtis, where can people find out more about some of your content and some of these courses? So they can go, so uh, just quickly, the workshops in Kelowna are, the first one is in June. It's June 19th through 23rd. We still have some tickets left for that one. The second one is July 17th through 21st. And then the third one is August 14th through 18th. They can find all of that information on my website, theurbanfarmer.co. 
and they can go, they can go slash events and then the tickets are available there. Awesome, man. I'll make sure that I put those links into the show notes below, both for the courses and for your website. If you're looking for free resources from Curtis, make sure you check out his YouTube channel. He puts tons of great information about running a market garden business, um, as well as how to run his farm, how he runs his farm on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and he pretty much puts out a video every day, except when he's having kids. So thanks so much for your time, Curtis. I look forward to the next time we get together and chat. Absolutely, Rob. Thanks a lot. Thank you.